Okay, folks, here's our final session of our conference. Again, we thank you for being here. We are so excited that all of you uh, made the effort to come out the last two days. So let's give a hand to Jacob Prash and uh, what the Lord's going to say through him. Well, blessings in Jesus. Thank you for joining us so much today. Our ministry is called Moriel. You can visit us on moriel.org for the sake of the camera. And also, we can watch this ugly face on Roku TV, on Vimeo, or on YouTube, Moriel TV. Just Google it and you'll find me. Uh, some people consider it a blessing. Some people consider it a curse. People either love me or hate me. Uh, I once spoke at a church. They were so impressed, they took up a huge love offering and put a contract on me. quite a thing. Nonetheless, turn with me, if you will, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Where does Jesus dwell? Where does Jesus choose to dwell? The Gospel of St. Matthew the fourth chapter. Verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, that is his cousin, Yohanan Hamadbil, John the Baptist, literally in Hebrew, John the Baptizer. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which was by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, Ishayahu Hanavi, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Jesus settled in the tribal regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, which had Galilee of the Gentiles and the Decapolis and Bashan, the Golden Heights on one side, on the east, and the area of the tribe of Ishakar on the other. We have to understand something about these 12 tribes. They are not only the names of 12 tribes, which have a correspondence, of course, to the 12 apostles, the 12 sons of Jacob, 12 apostles being the New Testament parallel. But they were also counties, shires, provinces. They were provincial areas designated to each tribe. So it was the name of, of a region as well as the name of the people who lived in the region according to the tribe. Some people ask the question, how will we know the 144,000, how will Jews know what tribe they're from? Unless they have a name like Cohen or Levi or Siegel, well, you can know that they're from the tribe of Levi, but otherwise, how can you tell? Now, David Nathan, David Nathan, yeah, it means uh, the beloved one who's given. I have a different name. Yaakov Prash. Yaakov comes from Akov, Hebrew, uh, meaning usurper, but translated swindler. Uh, <laughs> and Prash is Prashim, Pharisees. So <laughs> he's, he's the beloved one who God has given, like Nathaniel, Nathaniel, right? And I'm uh, a Pharisee and a swindler. But anyway. <laughs> I'm glad you can laugh. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's what my name really is. A Pharisee comes from Lefaresh, meaning to publish or to interpret. They were the ones who interpreted the scriptures. Um, that's what they were. Uh, at least that's what they thought they were. But yeah, that's my name. Such is it. So people ask, well, of course, now we have mitochondrial DNA. When I was in university, it was unknown that there was cytoplasmic DNA. 
DNA was only thought to be in the nucleus. We knew there was RNA in the cytoplasm, but not DNA. But now we have mitochondrial DNA, and if you can get enough signatures, you can identify ancestry. It's not gotten to the point yet, but it's getting there. Bone is hard tissue, okay? If you can get enough hard tissue, osteocytes, with long enough strands, you might eventually be able to match that with the DNA of Jews now and determine tribes. It's not quite there yet, but experiments have been going on for some time. And there are two yeshivas in Jerusalem, two yeshivas, who are quite serious about not only rebuilding the temple, but reactivating the Levitical worship system. And they have approximately 252 or 253 Kohanim priests. Priests. Uh, and this technology is going to get better. Uh, there was just a major breakthrough this past week on, on DNA, founding that it twists, and twists will determine the character that you've got these, anyway, my background was in science and I get carried away sometimes. You've got nucleotides that pair with each other in the double helix, but they always pair with another one, like guamine and yours, so they always pair with another one. With these twists, now they found that there's nucleotides that can pair with themselves. Can, you know, guanine can, can pair with another guanine. Major breakthrough last week. Now only people interested in genetics and microbiology would have heard about this probably. Most people wouldn't be interested. But this technology is getting better all the time. It is not unthinkable that it will be able to, that it will be practically possible to identify Jews by tribe if you've got enough bone tissue from enough of these tribal areas, these provinces, right, to get a good enough signature and, and enough commonality between the signatures to even go to the level of a tribe. They've been working on this for some years, and there's more and more breakthroughs all the time. It, it might eventually be, be possible, and maybe it might not take much longer for it to be possible. Again, they've already do have people who are identifiably Kohanim who are of common ancestry, uh, who, who are from the tribe of Levi. Um, be that as it may, the 144,000. Let's begin at the beginning. Jesus was prophesied by Isaiah the prophet to dwell in the tribal regions of the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun. Look with me, please, to Isaiah the prophet, chapter 9, something we all know, of course, from Handel's Messiah. We all know verse 6. A child is born to us, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. This, of course, speaks of the millennial reign of Christ. And his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Paleo Etz in Hebrew, Mighty God, El Gabor, and Eternal Father, Aviad, and Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. This will be no ordinary baby. But in verse 1 of chapter 9, bearing in mind there's no chapter divisions in the original Hebrew canon, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in earlier times. He treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. In the time of Jesus, you had the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. We're progressing now. If you can, in your mind's eye with a map, think of Tiberias which is on the northwest of the Sea of Galilee, coming around along the north to the northeast, ending at a place called Gensarin, okay? That area. There's no biblical record of Jesus ever having entered the main city of that time, still the main city of this time on the, on the Sea of Galilee, Tiberias. There's no record of him doing it. Jesus' ministry was always rural except when he went to Jerusalem for the pilgrim feast, his ministry was always rural, always rural. 
He didn't go to the main city of the, of the region, which was the seat of Roman government at the time, Caesarea, Maritina. He didn't go to Caesarea, Maritina. He only went to Jerusalem for the pilgrim feasts. He built up a rural following, knowing that the people would congregate in Jerusalem for the pilgrim feasts, and huge crowds began following him. This, of course, completely left the Sanhedrin flabbergasted. Where are all these people following this guy from? They were very much like modern politicians. You've got, you know, the people in New York and Chicago and Hollywood and Washington, they think that that's America. They don't, nothing personal, but they don't think much about Ohio or Indiana, you know. <laughs> Their world is Manhattan, Washington, D.C., Hollywood, and Chicago. That's how they think. That's how the people with the power generally think. You know, it, in Britain it's the same. There's London and then there's the rest of it. But you know, that's just the way it is. Well, that's the way it was then. Okay. Jesus' ministry where he lived was situated and focused on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. You have the lower Jordan River. Now it says on the other side of the Jordan. The lower Jordan begins on the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee. It's shaped like a harp. The Sea of Galilee in Hebrew is called the Kinetic, Kinetic from Kinoa Harp. It's shaped like a harp. So at the base of it, the river goes from the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee down, separating the Decapolis, apart from Beth Shan, from the Jordan Valley and the plain of Jericho. It just goes down all the way to the Dead Sea, the Yam HaMelech. But the Jordan begins north of the Sea of Galilee. Jordan means Yarden, Yarden, that which comes down from Dan, the area of the tribe of Dan, Yarden, that's what it means, okay? There are three sources, one of which is the water tables in the tribe of Dan, the other is the mounting snow caps of Mount Hermon coming down again through the water table into uh, Caesarea Philippe. Uh, this place is called Banyas, where Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and so forth. That's the second. And the third is the Hulda, Hulda Valley. There was a lake north of the Sea of Galilee called the Hulda, but that's all been drained for agricultural purposes and to depopulate the mosquito population. When the early Zionists settled Galilee, that was a breeding ground for, for malaria, uh, for no blaze mosquitoes. So they got rid of it and they just re recycled the water for agriculture. But those are the three sources. So the Jordan comes down on the north into the Sea of Galilee and continues flowing out of the south. Now, where it comes down from the north, it comes to a place called Bethsaida, Bethsaida, where some of the apostles lived, Bethsaida. On the west side of Bethsaida were Jews. On the east side of Bethsaida were a mixture of Jews and pagans going up into the Decapolis, the ten cities, from the Jordan Heights towards the south. That's why in Genserine there were pigs, you understand? On the Capernaum side of the Jordan, there'd be no pigs. So he cast the demons into the pigs, <laughs> and in Genserine, there would be pigs there. So it comes like that. That's where he was, is the area of the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. It never got much attention in biblical history, yet it was prophesied by Isaiah that's where the Messiah would live. That is where Jesus chose to live. He was born in Bethlehem, right? He was born in Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah, city of David. His parents took him to Nazareth, and that said it, okay? But he has to stay there. He goes and lives in Capernaum, in the area of Naphtali, Capernaum is Kafar Nahum, literally the village of the consoled one, or the village of, of consolation. Same as the prophet Nahum. Now it's not named after the prophet Nahum, but Nahum has the same name, means consoled, the one who was consoled. Kafar Nahum, the village of, of the consoled ones, or the village of the consolation, the ones who receive consolation. That's where he chooses to live. It was of no particular note Tiberias was the main city. However, there was a road towards Damascus, where St. Paul would later be saved, nearby, and 
it connected with the Roman Via Maris, which was a main road that was an interstate. Remarkably, there are still sections of it that are still there. It's incredible. There are sections of the Via Maris that are still there. That's how well the Romans built roads. And you can see this in Europe. There are sections of, of the Via Appia, the Appian Way, outside of Rome where the early Christians were. You can still drive on it. There's a bridge in Switzerland, an arch bridge. You can still drive a small truck over it, and the Romans built it. Incredible, incredible builders. Some of the stuff is still there. Anyway, without boring you with the archaeology of it, that's the basic background of where Jesus lived. But the question is, why did he choose to live in an area that was otherwise scripturally insignificant? These tribes did not get a lot of attention. This region never got a lot of attention. It was not of major importance in the day. It was the tax collecting station for goods going to and coming from Damascus, hence Matthew, the tax collector. That's all there was to it. Not a big place. Some agriculture and there was fishing. That was the industries. That was it. It was not a wealthy area. Most of the people were Amha Adits, the people of the land, poor people. Okay, poor people. Because the apostles had a business, because they were fishermen, they would have been the equivalent of lower middle class. Lower middle class, okay? They wouldn't have been the Amha Adits. They would have been socioeconomically a step above it. Jesus himself, he would not have been Amha Adits, but he would have been socioeconomically just one step above it. He had a trade. He was a carpenter, okay? So he, he wouldn't have been like, like a blue collar worker today, essentially. That's what he would have been, okay? That was his background. Well, anyway, that's simply the background. Whenever we see a mention of the tribes, we always have to go to the beginning. The prophecy of Jacob concerning the 12 tribes in Genesis 49. The entire history of Israel, but also the entire history of salvation, what a theologian would call Heilsgeschichte. I like to give things German names. Derives from Jacob's prophecy in chapter 49. This projects all the way ahead to Revelation chapters 7 and chapters 14, the 144,000. But it begins in Genesis 49. To understand the significance of these tribes, we have to understand the prophecy of Jacob. Everything about Israel and the Jews as God's agents of bringing the gospel to the nations, a light to the Gentiles, or the Goyim, derives from Jacob's prophecy, okay? Derives from Jacob's prophecy of Genesis 49 for the 12 tribes. Now we have a situation here. Jesus told the apostles he will judge the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? As best I can see, the 24 elders in Revelation are the 12 princes of Israel and the 12 apostles, okay? The best I can see that, some people say it's the church, but 24 is never the number of the church in Scripture. The number of the church in Scripture is usually seven. The number of the church is seven. This is 24, multiples of 12, organizations of people. It's the 12 apostles and the 12 sons of Jacob. I'm quite convinced. It's certainly not the church, as some people try to argue. Nonetheless, let's understand this. When you get to Revelation, the tribe of Dan is missing. Dan is replaced. The tribe of Joseph is split into two, okay? Again, for Emin, Manash, and so forth. The tribe of Joseph is split into two to make it 12. Dan goes. This corresponds directly in figure to the 12 apostles. Judas goes. The bad one goes and has to be replaced. You understand? It's all there. We know from church history that the early Christians speculated that the Antichrist would be from the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan were bad news most of the time because of the sin of Jeroboam II when he built the second golden calf. You can still go to where the ruins of the altar are up in northern Israel to the area of Dan. You can still see where that altar was. Because of their sin, Dan was disincluded. The second golden calf was a particular abomination because it was a throwback to what they did 
after the Exodus when they worshiped the golden calf in, in the wilderness. But let's look now. Let's just look at some of these tribes. The history of these tribes are played out in scriptural history. The predictions of Jacob are played out. For instance, look, let's, let's begin with Dan, verse 16. Dan shall judge his people. Dan comes from the word din, meaning law, okay? As one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heel so that the rider falls backward. That term falling backward is where you get the Hebrew word for backslider. Whenever you see a serpent that bites, okay, it always relates to Satan in figure, okay? Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, like the way that the serpent beguiled Eve? Satan always has two modes of attack. Again, most of you know this. The dragon and the serpent. The dragon is Satan the persecutor. The serpent is Satan the deceiver. But the serpent's bite is just as deadly as the dragon's bite. Well, this deception would come from the tribe of Dan, a horned snake in the path. Dan shall be a serpent in the way. The tribe of Dan is, of course, cursed. And again, the early Christians speculated that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan. But let's continue looking further at these prophecies. Chapter 49, verse 8. Judah, Yehuda, Yehuda, okay, means praiser. It's related etymologically to the term lechalel, to praise or to worship. Okay. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares to rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. To him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now we understand this to be a messianic prophecy about the Lord Jesus coming from the tribe of Judah. He lies down, he gets up again, he's fierce, you know. He's going to destroy the enemies of God and so forth. But the scepter shall not depart from Judah, the scepter representing political government authority, until Shiloh comes. Shiloh was, of course, the capital of Israel for over 200 years. But again, as I said yesterday, Shiloh, the word for apostle is Shiloach, the one who was sent, okay? The scepter shall not depart from Judah until the one who was sent shall come. You understand? Again, it's messianic. Okay. The Romans considered Herod to be a Roman. Herod the Great is a major, major type of the Antichrist. A major type. In Revelation chapter 12, you have what is known as a Pesher interpretation of Matthew's nativity narrative. You have the dragon trying to consume the baby coming out of the woman. And then when the baby is rescued, the dragon goes and makes war with the rest of her offspring, right? What does Herod do? He tries to kill Jesus. But when Jesus is rescued, he kills the other babies in Bethlehem, doesn't he? Herod is a major picture of the Antichrist. The nativity is a what we call a, a peshet, a simple story, but its pesher, its deeper meaning, is the return of Christ. <coughs> his first coming is a picture of his second. Now, if you're a new believer, don't worry about this stuff yet. <laughs> don't do calculus till you can do arithmetic, okay? <laughs> My wife's a math teacher, but anyway. Remember in Revelation 12, and then I saw a sign in heaven? And then the dragon comes with seven heads. Somehow Herod is in that character of that Antichrist figure from Daniel chapter 7. Now this is a very simple explanation. You can get my book, Shadows of the Beast, and read about it. Nonetheless, Herod was an Idumean. During the Hasmonean period, the intertestamental period, the Jews, after the time of the Maccabees, conquered Western Jordan including 
Edom, southern Jordan, okay? The Edomites who converted to Judaism settled in the northern Negev, Idumea, and they were called Idumeans, but they were ethnic Arabs, okay? So Herod was genetically and anthropologically, he was an Arab. However, by way of political convenience, his religion, he was a Jew. However, the Romans considered him to be a Roman. By nationality, by citizenship, by culture, he was a Roman. To the Europeans, he was a European. To the Arabs, he was an Arab. To the Jews, he was a Jew. That teaches something about the Antichrist, you understand? Everybody's going to think we can trust him, he's one of us. But he's not a man of the Arabs, he's not a man of the Jews, and he's not a man of, of the Europeans of the West. He's a man of Satan. But he's going to know how to bamboozle people. He's going to con Israel. Okay. The Romans trusted him so much that there was no Roman procurator. There was no Roman regional governor. Over all of their colonies and over all of their protectorates, there'd be a governor. But not in Judea. They had Herod. They didn't send somebody from Rome. Once Jesus is born, Herod the Great dies, then his son dies. The son is gone. Okay. They send Pontius Pilate. The scepter departs from Judah once Shiloh comes. You understand? Before that, Herod was called king of the Jews. He wanted to stay king of the Jews, but the Messiah came, who was the true king of the Jews, to displace him, and Herod knew it. Well, that, again, teaches about the Antichrist. He's going to want to keep power. <laughs> okay. Enough said. This is the prophecy about the tribe of Judah. There's more to it than that. I'm just touching some main points. Well, let's look a bit further. Another tribe. Let's look at the prophecy to the tribe of Benjamin in verse 27 as another example. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey, and in the evening he divides the spoil. Benjamin means son of the right hand. Benjamin. Okay. In the morning, he's a ravenous wolf. But at the evening, the end of the day, he divides the spoil. Dividing the spoil means getting God's reward. Like in Isaiah 53, he will divide the booty with the strong, it's the prophecy about Jesus. Getting the spoil relates to the meek inheriting the earth and things like this. Okay, the way it's used as an, as an idiomatically in the Old Testament in Hebrew. Benjamin always begins bad and ends good. King Saul was a Benjamite. He didn't kill Agag. So later on, a descendant of Agog called Haman, centuries later, arises to wipe out the Jews. Therefore, because it was a Benjamite who allowed this to happen, King Saul, it had to be a Benjamite who put it right. What tribe was Esther and Mordechai? Benjamin. You understand? The early Christians understood this as Paul the Apostle. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He began as persecuting the church, but he ends as the apostle to the Gentiles. Benjamin always begins bad, but ends good. It doesn't matter how bad you are in the beginning. It matters how good you are at the end, okay? That's Benjamin. Now, all these tribes, their history is played out scripturally, or the, the prophecy is played out historically, okay? But we read about Zebulun and Ishakar. They were right next to each other. <clears throat> and they were very similar. Zebulun will dwell at the seashore. The origins of the name Zebulun are probably not Hebrew. It's usually thought <coughs> to mean dwell in honor, dwell in honor. But it's, it's difficult to translate because its etym etymology is not, a, is not Hebrew. Zebulun will dwell at the seashore, and he shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall be towards 
Sidon. Now, this is a problem for some people because if you look on a map, it's inland. He could be a person with ships on the Sea of Galilee, but how is he going to get up to Sidon in Lebanon? Okay. Today, it is only navigable around the Mifrats of Haifa, <coughs> the Gulf of north of Haifa by Akko, between Akko and Haifa. Now, there it's a river and it's still navigable, very, very polluted, industrially polluted, horrible. But it was the same brook where Elijah threw the ashes of the priests of Baal after the confrontation on Mount Carmel. Okay. Today, again, most of the water is diverted for agricultural purposes. However, in biblical times, in ancient times, it was not. In ancient times, <coughs> the brook of Kishon was what we call an ahal, a river. It was navigable. Ships were much smaller then. They were the size of yachts, perhaps, at, at biggest ocean-going ones, and they followed the Phoenician pattern of sailing along the coast. They were largely coast-hugging vessels, okay? It would have been navigable then. You could have brought ships inland because it would have been navigable. It isn't now, but it would have been then. Now it's only navigable around Haifa. Um, so that's a prophecy concerning Ishtar and Zebulon, okay? That's the prophecy. But uh, it doesn't figure particularly significant in anything. Issachar does not, and Zebulun does not. Neither does Naphtali. Naphtali means in Hebrew struggles or wrestles. Struggles or wrestles. That's the prophecy of Naphtali. One who struggles or the one who wrestles. That's the way it is. But again, nothing particularly unique about Naphtali. Naphtali is a doe let loose. He gives beautiful words, but that's all it says. Beautiful words are going to come from Naphtali. So Jesus begins his ministry. He leaves Nazareth. He begins his ministry at Cana. Where is his headquarters? Where is his base of operations? He doesn't go to a city like Caesarea or Jerusalem, the two main cities. Jerusalem was sort of like a resort city, sort of like Atlantic City, New Jersey. In the summer, its population swells with tourists, but then it goes down again. Well, the population of Jerusalem was about 120,000, sizable for the time, but became much bigger during the pilgrim feasts for Passover, for the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. The pilgrims had to come, and the population would blow up. But the real big city was Caesarea. Caesarea Maritina on the coast, where Paul was imprisoned, was the fourth biggest city in the Roman Empire, in the known world, after, after um, Rome, and after Alexandria, and I think after Antioch. It was, like the, it was the fourth biggest city in the world at that time, certainly in the Roman Empire. He doesn't go to those places. He doesn't even go to the regional capital, Sephorus, or to Tiberias. He avoids the regional district capitals of the Roman government. He goes to Naphtali and Zebulun, next to Issachar, to fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. That's where he goes. That's where he sets up his headquarters in these little coastal towns, fishing villages. Okay. Why? Well, let's understand. He leaves Nazareth. Matt said it. Matt said it. You have a prophecy in the New Testament. When Herod tries to kill Jesus and they, Mary and Joseph are afraid of his son, they don't stay in Judah. They go to Galilee to Nazareth, and, Ma and Matthew writes, this is to fulfill the prophecy, he shall be called a Nazarene. 
The problem is there is no such prophecy anywhere in the Old Testament. There is no place he shall be called a Nazarene. However, in Isaiah 11, he shall be called a righteous branch. One letter difference. Nazareth, okay, Netzer, Netzer. In Hebrew wordplay, in Biblical Hebrew, it is different than in modern Hebrew and it's different than in English. In English, we use wordplay either as an advertising gimmick or to make a joke. You use one word that sounds like another to draw people's attention to something. I always tell that when I was a little boy near New York, there was a company called Quality Coal, and they spelt it K-O-A-L. They intentionally misspelled it to draw people's attention to it. We would use one word that sounds like another as an advertising gimmick or as a joke. In Biblical Hebrew, it was the opposite. There were no chapter divisions. These were just books. And the scribes, who were called the Sofrim, were people who used mathematics to guarantee accuracy. Because it was alphanumeric, because it was like Roman numerals, the letters were numbers, they knew the mathematical value of every verse. And they would count it up to make sure they didn't make a mistake. That is how they preserved accuracy. They used mathematics. These are the scribes called the Sofrim. They were experts in the text called the Sofrim from the Hebrew infinitive lispor, to count, to count. They literally counted the mathematical values. And they used certain devices the way we would use italicizing, underlining, and bold emboldening, okay? To designate the beginning of a new uh, pericope, they would put the first letter of it very dark. They'd make the first letter very dark, okay? They wouldn't bolden the whole thing, just the first letter. That would be the cardinal verse introducing a new passage, okay? They had that instead of chapters. That's the first thing they did, okay? This is broadly speaking now. Secondly, instead of underlining, they would change the size of the font, okay? They would change the size of the font and instead of italicizing, they would use wordplay. Now, I'm, I'm just trying to explain this in modern equivalence. It's, it's not a, I'm just trying to put it across the best, best way I, I can. They used wordplay. In Biblical Hebrew, when you use one word that sounds like another, it's to draw your attention to something very, very important. Look with me, please, to the book of Amos, chapter 8. Why did Jesus live in Nazareth? Chapter 8, verse 1. This is with Amos. Thus the Lord showed me, and behold, there was a basket of summer fruit. Tzel pri hakayetz. Pri hakayetz. Summer fruit. Okay. Now, if the fruit is not picked by the summer, the hot sun of the Middle East is going to burn it up, destroy it. And he said, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. And the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The kets, the termination, the terminal end. What do you see? pri summer. The kets has come for my people. It's the end. You understand? The sun would burn the fruit up at that time of year if it wasn't already harvested. Use one word that sounds like another. That's the way they kind of italicize, for want of a better way to explain it. Okay. You use one word that sounds like another. It means this is important. He shall be called the Nazarene. No, tzri. no, no, no such verse. But Isaiah 11, the Messiah shall be a righteous branch. A netzer. A netzer, okay. A netzer. Okay. The Hebrew word tzaddik 
is a name of a letter, tzaddik. It's sort of like a Y with a diagonal line under it, tzaddik. But it's also the Hebrew word for righteous. <laughs> he shall be a righteous branch. You use one word that sounds like another to give an emphasis. Okay, Hebrew letters all mean things. Like the letter shin, sh, sh, the SH sound. Okay, Shin is also the word for tooth. It looks like teeth, you know? <laughs> They all, they all mean something. Uh, David Nathan could tell you he grew up in a yeshiva, but uh, take my word for it. So that's the way it is. The Messiah would be a righteous branch. He's not going to be a Nosri, but he's going to be a Netzer. Netzer Tzaddik. It says the same thing in Jeremiah 23, that he's going to be this righteous, I'll raise up a righteous branch kind of thing. Okay. So today, you'll see rabbis called anti-missionaries who are trying to persuade Jews not to believe in Jesus. They'll try to make a big deal of this, but they're banking on the ignorance of other Jews. <laughs> you don't know the scribal methods. I mean, they actually know they're lying. <laughs> they actually know they're lying. It's unbelievable. So, he's in Nazareth. Turn with me, please, to the song of... Deborah, the book of Judges, chapter 5. Shoftim. When you read the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, it is very conspicuous that the Magnificat of Mary, blessed are you among women, in Luke's nativity narrative, okay, derives from the song of Deborah. Now let's look at this. We see the story in the book of Judges, chapter 5, verse 18. Zebulun was the people who despised their lives even to death, and Naphtali also on the high places of the field. Now in verse 24, most blessed of women is Yael, the wife of Heba, of the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. This speaks of the assassination, okay, that Yael and Deborah carried out against the king of the invaders on Mount Tabor, Har Tavor. Well, I'm sorry to bore you with geography. I should have had a map, but I had family issues this, these last few days, and I, I don't think too coherently under the best of circumstances, but this week I've even lost the plot completely. Let's say that this room, well, going this way, is the Valley of Jezreel. The Valley of Jezreel separates Galilee from Samaria. It is the agricultural belt of northern Israel, even to the modern day as it was in biblical times the Valley of Jezreel, sometimes called Emek Israel. Okay. On the east is Har Gilboa, Mount Gilboa. Okay. On the west is Har Carmel, Mount Carmel, separating the Mediterranean from the valley. Okay. Close to the halfway point, going east to west, there are two mountains on either side. On the north side, on the Galilee side, is Har Tavor, Har Tavor, Mount Tabor, where Yael and Deborah killed Sisera, assassinated Sisera. Okay. Directly opposite, on 180 degrees, say that door was Har Tavor, that door is Har Megiddo, Mount Megiddo. People say the Valley of Armageddon. No, no. Armageddon, Megiddo, is not a mountain. It's a, <laughs> it's a valley. That's a mountain. It's not a valley. The valley is the Valley of Jezreel. Okay. Megiddo has got 32 layers, stratas, of tells, of being built and rebuilt. It's amazing. So you've got that mountain, Har Megiddo, Mount Megiddo, 
directly opposite on the north side, on the Galilee side, that's on the Samaria side, on the Galilee side, on the north, you have Mount Tabor, where the song of Deborah takes place. Napoleon ascended Mount Tabor and looked at the Valley of Jezreel when he came to the Middle East to defeat the Mamelukes. And he said, this is the perfect place for my ultimate military campaign. Then he tries to reunite, reconfederate the Roman Empire, puts the emperor's crown on his own head, makes himself emperor, and the believers in England thought he was the Antichrist, with good reason. What he did does typify what the Antichrist is going to do. Nonetheless, this is Mount Tabor. Just on back of Mount Tabor is a lower mountain. So you got a higher one and a lower one on the north. This one is Har Tavor, Mount Tabor. And in, its, in, in the shadow of Mount Tabor is Nazareth, today called Nazareth Alit, Upper Nazareth. We know from the Gospel narratives the original Nazareth was on the hill. On the hill, okay. We tried to throw him off the cliff. Maybe we'll explain about that some other time. Nonetheless, that was it. It was in the shadow of Mount Tabor. You can see it. If you're a pretty good hiker and you've got a good pair of hiking boots, you can walk it. You can walk down from Nazareth and up to Mount Tabor in about a half day if you're, if you're accustomed to hiking. You can do it. Hikers, there are hikers who do it. Okay. It's there. It's prominent. It dominates the landscape. <laughs> you can't miss it. And so you've got a little Jewish girl. I don't know if they played hopscotch or jumped rope or whatever, but her name was Miriam, Miriam, with the root Mera, Mera, bitterness, okay? Fulfilling the prophecy of Simeon that is sword would pierce her own heart. And she's growing up in the shadow of Mount Tabor. And she would have known, like everyone would have known, that's where it happened. That's where Deborah and Yael were told, you, blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women. That's the song of Deborah. Blessed are you among women, Yael. Okay. She would have known this growing up. Little did she know that an angel Gabriel, Gabriel, the mighty one of God from the book of Daniel, would have appeared to her and told her, Medium, blessed are you among women. <laughs> Can you imagine? She's growing up in the shadow of Mount Tabor. Blessed are you among women. Everybody knew it, but now Gabriel tells her, Don't blessed are you among women. What happened on Mount Tabor is only a shadow of you, an Old Testament shadow, a type of what was going to happen to you. Now, again, you have to know the geography of Israel to understand these things, but it's there, plainly there, very plainly. Well, this is the Song of Deborah. Now look at the prophecies in Deborah about these tribes who came to war, okay, against Sisera. We begin in verse 15, and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As was Issachar, so was Barak, which means blessed. You get the name Baruch from it. Into the valley they rushed at his heels, again the valley of Jezreel, same as the valley of Armageddon as we call it, same place, only Megiddo is not a valley, it's a mountain, but it's the same place. Whenever you see a military conflict, and there were many military conflicts in the valley of Megiddo, they're types, they're foreshadowings of the ultimate one prophesied in Revelation 16 and in Zechariah. The military history of what transpired in Megiddo, each one of those wars or battles, is a picture of some conflict at the end. Sisera being a type of the Antichrist and so forth, but I won't bore you with that now. You can read the book if you want to. And how it was a Jew and a Gentile woman working together. <laughs> the church and Israel. But again, I only mention these things in passing. Okay. Why do you sit among the shepherds to, to hear the piping for the flocks among the divisions of Reuben? There were great searchings of heart. Why? Oh, Reuben didn't want to fight. Gilead remained across the Jordan. And why did Dan stay in ships? Asher sat down at the seashore and remained by its landings. These other guys didn't want to fight. 
Issachar did. The others didn't. They ran scared. They were afraid of the armies of Sisera in the valley of Megiddo. But Zebulun was a people who despised their lives even to death. And Naphtali also on the high places of the field. Why did Jesus choose to dwell among Naphtali and Zebulun? He who loves his life will lose it. He who would gain his life will lose it. He who loves his life will hate it. Last night, my mother cashed in her chips. I loved my mother, but I hated her life. Everybody in my family is either Jewish or Roman Catholic, everybody. I love the Jewish people, but I hate Talmudic Judaism. I hate what they believe in. I hate what they trust in. They trust in a corruption of the Torah. They claim to be the keepers of the Torah. No, no. Yeshua, Jesus, made it clear. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. Remember, the problem of unsaved Jews is not that they don't believe in Jesus. That's the co consequence. That's the result of the problem. The problem is they don't believe Moses and the prophets. If they really believed the Torah, they'd know he was the Messiah. Their rejection of Yeshua as the Messiah is not the problem. It's the consequence of the problem. The problem is they don't believe the Old Testament. They don't believe Moses and the prophets. If they did, they'd know Yeshua was the Messiah. Okay? I love the Jewish people, but I hate what they are. What do you do when you have a, a Catholic mother trusting in a scapula around her neck instead of in the blood of Jesus? Instead of knowing that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, you have to die in fear, and she died in fear, believing she had to atone in purgatory for her own, a false gospel of a false Christianity. That I love my mother? Of course I did. But I hated what she was. I hated what she believed in. When I was a youth, I was a communist. Then I became a cocaine addict and a drug dealer. Fornicator, all the rest of it. But cocaine was a white collar drug. It was not like heroin. It was professional people did it and things like this. It was called the rich man's high in those days. Only I wasn't a rich man, I was a student, so I, I, I trafficked in it. I dealt to, to, to subsidize my addiction. That's what I was. I had to be stoned on coke and have a few joints. I'd wake up in the morning, shoot coke, smoke a couple of joints, fornicate with my girlfriend, then go out the door. That was, I had to hate my life in this world. I had to hate it. He who would gain his life will lose it. If you love your life, you're going to hate it. And so these other tribes, they didn't show up for the fight. But Zebulun and Naphtali in verse 18 was the people who despised their lives even to death. If you don't hate your life in this world, Jesus doesn't dwell with you. But he always dwells with those who hate their life in this world. This life is a heartbreaker. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. It's all vanity. It's all in vain. Make the best of a bad thing. Love God and keep his commandments. Trust in the coming of Jesus. But if you set your heart on this place, you're going to be very disappointed. It's all in vain. No matter how much power you accumulate, no matter how much wealth you accumulate, you're going to wind up just as dead as the next person, as a poor person. It doesn't matter. It's all vanity. It says in the, the Latin Vulgate, is, it, it, it really translates it well. Vanitas vanitatem, omnia vanitas. It's all in vain. It's hopeless. It's in vain. If you don't hate your life in this world, you... You don't love it. If you don't lose your life in this world, you're never going to gain it. You want Jesus to dwell with you. You want him to dwell in your family and in your church. 
you have to be like Zebulun and Naphtali, people who despise their lives even to death, and Naphtali also. The story then continues. The kings came and fought. They fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh near the waters of Megiddo. That's the place again, same as the Valley of Jezreel, same place, Megiddo. They took no plunder in silver. The stars fought from heaven. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. You see the stars fighting from heaven. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation show us that there's a correlation between the struggles on earth and the struggles in the heavenlies. Remember the principality of Persia and Daniel? What you see over Iran now, Shia Islam, there's no doubt in my mind that that's what Daniel saw, that Iran is going to emerge to try to destroy Israel at the end of the world. <laughs> and it's a reflection of a battle between Michael, Mikhail, and the principality over Persia. These things you see happening in the Middle East, these political struggles and things with Mr. Trump warning about Iran and Mr. Obama selling out to Iran and whatever you want to call it, these things are only a reflection of what is happening in the heavenlies. Satan got his biggest defeat in Jerusalem. He gets his final defeat there. The Jews must be there for Jesus to return, according to Matthew 23, 39 and Luke 12. Uh, Luke 21, uh, 24, and Zechariah 12. Satan knows this. He has to try to displace the Jews. He has to try to get them out of there. He'll use Obama. He'll use the United Nations. He'll use the Arab League. It's a spiritual battle. What you see happening politically and strategically, even in Syria now, is only a reflection of what's happening in the heavenlies. Stars fighting from heaven. The torrent of Kishon, that was the brook where Elijah went through the ashes, which at that time was navigable. That's how the tribe of, of, of Naphtali and, and Issachar and uh, of Zebulun could have reached the Mediterranean. Okay. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, O oh my soul, march on with strength. And so it goes. Now look very carefully. They took no plunder in silver. The Hebrew term for silver is kesef, kesef. The Hebrew term word for money is kesef. How much silver do you have? Come a kesef yeshlacha. How much money do you have? Come a kesef yeshlacha. Same word. Silver is money, money is silver. Unlike gold, which is non-corrosive, it doesn't oxidize, silver is of temporary value, okay? Silver will tarnish, it's only of temporary value. It has to do with the price of redemption, the half shekel for the firstborn, a picture of Christ. Jesus was betrayed for silver. It's of temporary value, okay? The ultimate value is gold, because it doesn't oxidize in biblical symbolism. As you progressed into the Holy of Holies from the temple, first it was the Nehoshet, the bronze, the brazen altar, then silver, but then gold. In the Holy of Holies, it was all gold. The more you progress, okay. The idea is to get the gold. Silver is a value, but of temporary value. The world uses people to get kesef. God uses kesef to get people. You understand? Missions, evangelism. The world uses people to get money. God uses money to get people. It's of temporary value. They didn't take any. They didn't want the plunder of silver. They were not lovers of money. The greatest rabbi who ever lived said, Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Nothing, absolutely nothing, will indicate somebody's true standing before God than their attitude towards finance and material wealth. Money makes the world go round. Where your heart is, your treasure will be also. Nothing will show somebody's 
commitment to Christ more than their attitude towards temporal wealth and finance. Nothing. Put your money where your mouth is. Now for a Christian, a true Christian, it's simple. If you're flat broke, you've just won a billion dollar lotto, but you haven't got the check in the mail yet. You're guaranteed it's coming. We're co as with Christ. If you're flat broke, you're unbelievably wealthy. <coughs> the meek shall inherit the earth. We'll co reign with Christ in the millennium, then there's eternity. If you're flat broke, you're a wealthy person whose check hasn't arrived yet. If you're a wealthy person, you're flat broke. You're only a steward of what God has allowed you to manage. <laughs> Lord, why did you give me this affluence? Why did you give me this money? We read this in Romans 12. Let he who gives, give with liberality. People don't notice it, but the New Testament plainly teaches there's a gift of philanthropy. There are people who God prospers in business and professions. He prospers them because he uses them to fund missions, evangelism, charity, things of this nature. Okay. If you're flat broke, consider yourself rich. Your father's rich. The check's in the mail. Don't worry about it. Jesus is coming if you're flat broke. If you're rolling in dough, <laughs> you're flat broke. You're only a manager, a steward of what belongs, what the Lord has trusted you with to manage till he gets here. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Any other attitude towards money is wrong. Any other attitude towards material wealth is wrong. That's the only attitude for a believer. We're all rich and we're all broke. Every one of us is rich, and every one of us is flat broke, irrespective of how many figures are in our bank book or what we own or control or whatever. Well, let's look. Our equity is in the coming kingdom, not this one. Zebulun and Naphtali, people who despise their lives even to death, they didn't want the silver. They weren't interested in the money. They were interested in the victory. They fought the kings of Cana, but they took no plunder in Kesef. Kesef, money. In Hebrew, there's no distinction between the precious metal and the currency. It's the same, same thing. Well, where does Jesus dwell? among those who hate their lives in this world and who are not lovers of money. <laughs> That's where he dwells. That's where he chooses to dwell. He could have lived in any one of these tribal areas. His mother grows up in the shadow of where this song happens. As a baby, he's brought to the shadow of this very mountain where this takes place, where this prophecy was given. Song of Deborah, everybody in Nazareth would have known it. That's where it was. This is where I'm going. I'm going to Naphtali. I'm going to Zebulun. Well, let's continue. Turn with me, please, to First Kings. I'm sorry, First Chronicles, chapter twelve. In Hebrew, we call Jesus Ben David Yeshua, Jesus, son of David. The enthronement of King David is a picture of the enthronement of Christ in the millennium. One of the things that teaches about the millennial reign of Christ is the reign of David, where David ruled with a rod of iron, where there was peace between Jew and Gentile, remember King Hiram, and where there was peace all around and he ruled with justice. This was David, a type of Christ, Ben David Yeshua. The enthronement of David is a picture of the enthronement of Jesus, okay? Well, let's look now, who enthrones David? Same ones who are gonna enthrone Jesus, same kind of people. Verse 23 of 1 Chronicles 12. Now these are the numbers of the divisions equipped for war who came to David at Hebron. Hebron relates to the Hebrew word hitabrut, fellowship, bricked, cemented together, to turn the kingdom of Saul to him. 
according to the word of the Lord. There's going to be a new boss. The sons of Judah who bore shield and spear were 6,800 equipped for war. <coughs> of the sons of Simeon, mighty men of valor, 7,100. Of the sons of Levi, 4,600. Now I suppose you could apply this in a spiritual way. This many Baptists, this many Pentecostals, this many Mennonites. Now Jehoiada was the leader of the house of Aaron, and with him were 3,700. Also Zadok, a young man mighty of valor, and of his father's house, 22 captains. <coughs> Verse 29. Of the sons of Benjamin, Saul's kinsmen, 3,000. For until now, the greater part of them had kept their allegiance to the house of Saul. That's always a tragedy. A backslidden house. Saul became a murderer, a necromancer, a practicer of the occult. Assassinated Abiathar the priest, tried to murder David, who, saved, who spared his life, who killed Goliath. Terrible man. But even people who knew he was wrong, like his son Jonathan, stayed loyal to him. David mourned the death didn't he? You have a psalm not in the book of Psalms in Samuel, how the mighty have fallen. It's terrible when you see people remaining loyal to the house of Saul. I see this in England all the time. Everybody knows the Church of England is a joke. Everybody. Everybody. You look at what they're doing, with the, the compromising on the homosexuality and the rest of it, the people, the martyrs who reformed the Church of England, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, Thomas Cranmer and Ridley and Latimer and Hooper, they would be out the door of the Church of England today faster than they were out the door of the Church of Rome in the 16th century. Yet there's believers who stay in it thinking somehow what's going to do. They remain loyal to the house of Saul gets to the point, come out of her, my people. Well, they will wind up dead on Mount Gilboa. You understand? They'll wind up hanging dead on the walls of Bet Shan. Then it goes on. Of the sons of Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous men in their father's households. Of the half-tribe of Manasseh, remember half were on the Transjordan, Half were not. 18,000 who were designated by name to come and make David king. Of the sons of Issachar. I love these guys. They were the next door neighbors of Naphtali and Zebulun. Just on the other side of that same brook of Kishon. Of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Their chiefs were 200, and all their kinsmen were at their command. Daniel tells us in chapter 11, in the last days when the Antichrist is manifested, those who have understanding of the times will give understanding to the many, like the Maccabees did. The people who understood prophecy and understood what was happening are going to enthrone David. They're going to be the ones that Jesus is going to use to establish his messianic kingdom. The ones who understand prophecy and the character of the tribe of Issachar, next door neighbors of Zebulun and Naphtali. Okay. Well, let's look. Of Zebulun, verse 33, there were 50,000 who went out in the army who could draw up in battle formation with all kinds of weapons of war and help David with an undivided heart. <laughs> and of Naphtali, there were a thousand captains and with them 37,000 with shield and spear. If you put Zebulun and Naphtali and their next door neighbor together, it was more than all the other tribes together, far more. There may be some good people in this church or that denomination or this one, whatever. 
But it's always going to be the ones who hate their lives in this world and who are not lovers of money. They're going to provide the most warriors. They're going to provide the most victorious armies. They're going to be the ones who are going to enthrone the son of David. Look how many there were compared to the others. They smoked everybody. They eclipsed everybody. Of the Danites who could draw up in battle formation, 28,000. Of Asher, 40,000. Who went down to the army to draw up in battle formation from the other side of the Jordan, of the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Anasha, there was 120,000 with all kinds of weapons of war for battle. All these being men of war who could draw up in battle formation came to Hebron with a perfect heart to make David king of all Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one mind to make David king. They were there with David three days eating and drinking, for their kinsmen had prepared for them. Moreover, those who were near to them, even as far as Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali, bought food on donkeys, camels, mules, and oxen, great quantities of flour, cakes, fig cakes, Bunches of raisins, wine, oil, oxen, and sheep. There was indeed joy in Israel. Now again, those tribes outnumbered all the other tribes on the west side of the Jordan together. You'd have to bring the tribes from the Transjordan to catch up to them in size, okay? They provided the most warriors. But they did something else. They fed the other tribes. <laughs> They fed and equipped the other tribes. It's always going to be Zebulun and Naphtali, Issachar. They will always be the ones who've got the food. <laughs> They've got the food. They'll be the ones. The good and faithful servants who gives the proper food at the proper time, they'll be the ones. That's where Jesus dwelt. Could have lived anywhere he wanted. Could have went to a big city, regional capital. Could have lived in any of those tribal regions. But he chose to live Zebulun, Naphtali, Issachar. That's where he chose to live. Those were the tribes he used the most. the way it was in the days of David and that's the way it's going to be in the days of the son of David Issachar Zebulun and Naphtali he will dwell in honor among those who struggle the battle is everything the goal they're not in it for the money they're only in it to see their king enthroned. That's where Jesus dwelt then. And that's the same place where Jesus dwells now. God bless and thank you for listening. <laughs>